received his BS in Biochemistry, Psychology, and Fine Arts from the University of Arizona, his naturopathic medical degree from Bastyr University, and he did a postgraduate fellowship in family medicine through the American Board of Naturopathic Medical Specialties, as well as multiple residencies at alternative cancer clinics in Mexico. He's a past president of the Arizona Naturopathic Medical Association and Physician of the Year 1997. Dr. Morris was one of the founding board of directors of the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine as well as member of the clinical faculty. He's the developer of the resident sound therapy and is currently writing a book on this topic as well as developing a clinical training program he tends to take worldwide. Before I are you uh, giving out any papers to get the book or something like that? Did you say you had? Yeah, I'll say Okay, you can talk. I'll give you Dr. Lance. And so the previous speakers, um, you know, are relevant to me because I think there's a natural segue. And I'm curious, how many people in this room, if they'll be honest, still smoke? Anybody at all? Anybody? How many people used to smoke? So, and so, you know, it's interesting. Let me just let me share um, a, a little story with you to start. Um, the resonance sound therapy work that I've been developing um, really goes back about 40 years. And 40 years ago, I was introduced into this energy stream that was very, very powerful. It was too powerful. It was frightening. Um, and in this energy stream, I was aware that um, there was an ability coming through my body to heal people things. And I was given a choice, and the choice was to embrace love or power. And with every fiber of my being, I embraced love. And in doing that, about 40 years ago, I thought that I was saying no to this very powerful energy stream. Well, about two years ago, this energy came back into my life in a very tangible way. And this time, I was given a very, very clear message. And the message was that I had misunderstood 40 years ago, <clears throat> but that I wasn't ready 40 years ago. And I am now. And so for about two years, I've been developing this in a therapeutic context. And as I've been doing this, one of the things that's been very interesting is that I've come to recognize that it has a very deep shamanic component to it, that it has an American Indian component to it when I let that happen. And um, you are the first audience that I am formally presenting this information to. I presented this to colleagues. Um, I have a short paper that I put out there, if any of you are familiar with Townsend Newsletter, um, I submitted an article to them, which it's 18 pages, so it's like it's too big for them. I don't know what they're going to do with it. Um, but it's an excerpt from a book that I've almost finished. And on the table over there is a blue handout that kind of gives you just a few little highlights from the book. And I invite any of you, if you find this interesting um, before the evening is through, there's a sign-up sheet. And if you give me your email address, when the ebook is ready, then I will email everyone and say you can order it as an ebook before it goes to hard copy publishing, which 
I'm really fascinated with this concept of ebooks. Has anybody ordered an ebook ever? Cool. So you're a little more enlightened uh, group than, than usual. <clears throat> but it's, you know, maybe there's something to this. Maybe we should do things to reduce our use of paper on this planet. What a novel idea, ebooks. Maybe books, hard copy books, are going to be passe, maybe in our lifetime. That would be an interesting phenomenon. Um, so I want to share this, this little story, though, at the beginning here about tobacco. <clears throat> and hopefully, this is something you can share to anyone that you know that still smokes. <clears throat> Before the white men came to the New World, before they came to the Americas, native shaman and Indian medicine men all over the Americas had the same vision. The same vision. They saw the coming of the white man. With the coming of the white man, they saw the destruction of their way of life. They saw their children murdered their women raped, their culture virtually decimated. So they called powwow. They called the sacred circle and they came together. And in the sacred circle, they asked Mother Earth and Father Sky, what are we to do? They asked the spirits of all of the animals and all the plants, what are we to do? And there was a universal consensus. The consensus was someone has to kill the white man. Someone has to kill him. So the shamans asked the spirits of all of the plants, who among you will help us? And the plant said, not I. We will not help you. And they asked the spirit of all of the animals, who among you will help us? And the animal said, not I. They asked Mother Earth and Father Sky, and there was silence. And the medicine men wept. But then from the back, from the very back of the medicine circle, tobacco stood up. <laughs> tobacco that is the sacred plant, the sacred plant that is used to call spirit forth. Tobacco that is used in the teepee, in the medicine circle, in the sweat lodge to call spirit forth. Tobacco, the sacred plant, stood up and said, I will help you. I will do this deed. But there is a warning. Any who use me for their own purposes, white, Indian, black, it doesn't matter, will suffer the same consequence. I will kill you. I will kill you. So what I tell my patients, my friends, is take tobacco and stand with your feet, your bare feet upon the earth, and light it and face the east, and hold the smoke in your mouth. Do not inhale it. Blow it out and invite the spirits of the East to come. <laughs> to turn to the West and to hold the smoke in your mouth, standing barefoot upon the earth, and to blow the smoke out. Invite the spirits of the West into the circle. <laughs> from the North, from the South, Mother Earth, Father Sky, to come to come into the circle here with us, to call spirit, to call spirit. That if we use tobacco in this sacred way, if we remember and we invite all of our fellow humans to do this process, we will stop trying to use tobacco for our own purposes. You see, part of what I've discovered through my RST work, resonance sound therapy, is that the human body is a conduit. It is a conduit for spirit. It is a conduit for chi. What this gentleman shared about finding, you know, the, the energy. It's like, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's that part of the piece 
is a critical, critical piece. You know, pure food in, detox, and then finding the energy to get the stream, the flow, the chi, the spirit, ha, to start to move again. So, <clears throat> if we invite our friends and family and neighbors to use tobacco in this way, uh, um, we'll stop abusing it. The, the spirit that the tobacco brings cannot be held in the body. That's the reason it harms us. It brings spirit. It actually brings spirit into the physical dimension. Tobacco brings spirit. So if we hold it in the physical body, we're trapping it. Our body is a conduit. The spirit, the chi, is meant to flow through. It's not to be held. It has to flow through. And so with this work, what, what I'm engaging is a process that I define as healing as differentiated from curing. Very, very important differentiation. Healing is allowing that which is to be. Curing is man's attempt to interfere with nature's process. And we can do it with technology up to a point. But the real key is from the inside out. It's healing. And with healing, what you need to come to understand is that it's not about the resolution of pain or symptoms or a disease pathophysiologic process. It's about getting the life force opened up and waking up and learning what it is we need to learn for ourselves from our own heart. That may allow a disease to resolve. On the other hand, it may not. So this work, when I do this, one of the things I've discovered because I specialize in um, doing, so I gotta do it down here, in doing, um, just gonna, right, right. wait a minute, yeah, okay. Um, one of the things that's come in the couple of years that I do this work is, is a lot of hospice work. What I've discovered is that um, I deal with a lot of terminal patients. I specialize in alternative cancer therapy. So a lot of my patients are dying um, and die. Um, and one of the things I've discovered in this work is that um, we help them come to that, that space where they're ready to let go. They stop fighting anymore. Um, and when we stop fighting, an interesting thing happens. Sometimes the body heals and the disease goes away. But other times the body drops and that's the way it should be because we're not in a war. In natural medicine, our viewpoint is that is that we're not in a war, we're not engaged in a process fighting disease. That disease is not our enemy. Disease is a, a tool that we use to help us wake up. So resonant sound actually stands for resonant sound, modulated frequency, fascial release therapy. So in this lecture, I hope to give you some clarity of understanding about what the sound is, how we use the sound, what the fascial membrane is, what its real importance in the human body is, and what the modulating frequency um, is and how we utilize that in conjunction. The interesting thing about this work is that this work is human to human, person to person. It is not machine to human. No machine can do what we can do. We are a living, organic, breathing source of chi, of spirit. Machines are not spirit. They are not chi. They will not do it. Um, I use a lot of intravenous vitamin C and hyaluronic acid for treating cancer. The last time I came to this lecture and presented, which was three, four years ago, I presented a paper about vitamin C and hyaluronic acid. That's something external. We have been taught in our culture that the answers are external, that we have to seek them externally. You know, we're starting to come though full circle and realize that maybe we need to start getting the answers from inside. Get the answers from inside. So obviously, resonant sound therapy has several levels of clinical application. There's, 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 there's this process that I hope to be teaching clinicians how to utilize this with patients. But then there's a whole pantheon of, of pieces of this work that's about people helping themselves. And some of it is just amazingly simple. Amazingly simple. One of uh, the things I was exposed to 
as I was developing this work was one of, I, I was taking a jazz improv class at the university in, in Arizona. And um, for me to say that's a really remarkable thing because I'm a, I'm a kid that grew up knowing that I couldn't sing at all. I had no capacity to hold a tone, a tune in any way. So for me to take a jazz improv class, because this, this was vocal, this was scatting. You know, it's like, that's not, that's not even feasible. But um, what's happened in this process is I have found my own voice. And um, what I've also found is that there is a universal language that we all speak. And the language is a language of sound. It transcends language as spoken word. So what I have a patient do is <clears throat> to make a vocal tone. And um, sometimes we can use something as simple as vowel sounds. A, E, I, I, as a reference point, a starting point for sound. Just humming, hum, oh. But interestingly, what I've found, and I ask patients to do this, is to use a specific vocal mantra tone. Are, are people in the audience familiar with the concept of mantra? The concept of using vocal sound as a resonant induction to change body physiology and consciousness. To change body physiology and consciousness. So the most famous mantra is uh, <clears throat> is Aum in Western culture, right? I mean, we've all heard that. O M A U M. What did I do? I went the wrong way. Uh, uh, I did. Um, okay. <clears throat> so the sound, though, that I I usually ask people to engage is is a mantra that comes to us from traditions of the Druids um, in Ireland and England. It comes to us from Buddhist traditions. And in more recent historical times, it comes to us from the teaching, a teaching called Ekinkar. Anyone heard of Ekinkar? Ekinkar, the religion of light and sound. Kind of an interesting concept. But they primarily teach the use of a mantra, hue, H-U. So hue is the building block from which all other sounds are derived. So hue. So I ask people to start with that tone, and then what I do is create very complex resonant overtones to create a body harmonic to change cellular function. Coupled with that is this modulating frequency. What I've discovered is that the life force, the chi that flows through our body, flows from the earth through our feet, and it flows in a spiral, right? It flows in a spiral. And it actually looks like the DNA helix. You know what DNA looks like? So DNA looks like this, right? It looks like this. It's a double helix, double helix, double helix, double helix. So it's flowing up from our feet through our acupuncture meridians, through the chakras, out the top of our head, and then back down through the spiral. It's a continuous flow. And practices like Tai Chi and Qigong and any of the martial arts are basically forms ha, to let this energy flow through us. So one of the things I ask people to do is to stand upon the earth daily barefoot. How many people do that anymore? Stand upon the earth barefoot to ground ourselves. Do you realize that many of us have now spent the remainder of our lives, or that, uh, the life that we've had to this point, and we wear rubber-soled shoes, 
and we go from carpets to shoes to slippers to carpet to shoes. I mean, we have stopped grounding ourselves on the earth. Let me share with you folks, this is a problem. <laughs> This is a problem. This is one of the major reasons that we are suffering the health conditions that we are suffering is we have disconnected from the earth. You know, when we're babies, you know how we eat? What do we eat with? Our hand, right? And how quickly do we teach babies, don't do that. Stop that. Don't use those hands. And what do we use? We use metal utensils. The chi, the life force that flows through our body, is electromagnetic. Metal is electroconductive. It draws the chi away from us. We need to learn to eat with our hands and wood, chopsticks and wooden utensils, and ground upon the earth, ground our feet upon the earth. If you have tile or wood in your home, then you're grounding. But if you have carpet or concrete or um, linoleum or some other stuff, you're not. <clears throat> so this quality of this chi, as I said, having the spiral characteristic, imagine the DNA molecule, but it's light. It's pure light. And one side of the spiral is flowing up, the other side is flowing down. One side is flowing up, the other side is flowing down at the same time. This is the way the chi flows through the body. So what I've discovered is a way to modulate the frequency to, through rhythmic motion with a patient to start to let this chi flow through and using sound as the carrier wave. So <clears throat> what I believe is the reason that we develop diseases, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, is that we block the chi by torquing the fascial membrane. So what is the fascia? Where are we? Go machine, go. Um, okay, so the fascia, right? is this thinner than tissue paper transparent membrane surrounding every muscle, right? Under the skin, surrounds every muscle, right? When you cut a piece of meat, sometimes you see that, that little transparent piece, right? You know, particularly with like chicken skin, right? So that's the fascial membrane, but follow this. It not only surrounds every muscle, it, at the end of the muscles, it surrounds all of the ligaments and tendons, right? And all those ligaments and tendons attach to the bones. The periosteum is the fascial membrane around the bones themselves. So this membrane is the only part of the human body that is 100% contiguous. It goes through the blood-brain barrier, through the meninges of the brain, from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet the only part of the human body that is 100% contiguous. So, how important is it? This is just an example, you know, talking about, this is the, the, the you know, skin connective tissue, aponeuroses, loose areolar tissue, um, pericranium. This is the, this is the scalp. This is just, you know, a, a cross section of our scalp. But, you can start to see some of the depth of the layering of these dif different fascial, you know, fascial membranes. Um, so how important is the fascia? Well, my contention is that the fascia really needs to be thought of as an organ. And I believe it's actually the most important organ in the body. I think, I believe it's more important than our brain and more important than our hearts. So um, <clears throat> I understand a couple months ago that uh, Bruce Lipton you know, spoke to this group. And one of the things he talks about is, is this importance of, of membranes. You know, so this is a comment you know, from him. You can remove the nucleus of a cell, 
and it still functions, right? I mean, a lot of people, if you mention that, you're going to take the nucleus out. What happens to the cell? It dies. Well, no. If you take the nucleus out, it doesn't die. But if you take the membrane away, it dies. There's nothing holding it together. The membrane is the key. So neither the nucleus in an individual cell nor the genes exclusively control or regulate or determine the form nor the function of a cell, organ, system, or person. I believe that membranes from the subatomic to the macrocosmic level play a critical, yet to be fully recognized, understood, or utilized role. Um, and that RST is a tool that can help us accelerate this knowledge base. So um, I'm assuming most of the group here is familiar with string theory, some of the basics of string theory. You know, string theory is predicated on this idea that there are these vibrating string-like particles they're vibrating. They have a musical component to them. And that their vibration causes them to coalesce to form membranes, which are referred to as brains, B-R-A-N-E-S, in string theory. And, and I suggest maybe um, you know, we need to call those brains B-R-A-I-N-S, you know, that maybe the membrane is the brain is really the medium through which consciousness enters into the form that we then call a thing. Uh, so this vibrating quality, as I said, has a musical component. The question is, does vibration cause sound or does sound cause vibration? In the physical dimension, I mean, it seems that you know, we have this clear understanding that vibration causes the sound. But I think that there's a body of evidence to suggest, and it comes from spiritual traditions that involve the use of mantra, um, the use of, of Shabda Yoga, which is the, the yoga of the sound current, that sound is preeminent, that sound is the great cause creating force. Um, so when we're looking at a human embryo, it's the division right, of from the ovum to two cells, four cells, eight cells. It's, it's the creation of a series of membranes that differentiate, that allow each of these components to then form the different organs and structures. So my contention is that it is the membrane that is the thing that allows for the differentiation and not the stuff inside the membrane. It takes the membrane to form the matrix so that the stuff can then fill it. Is the membrane just a boundary? Yes, it is. It's the, and without that boundary, you cannot compartmentalize. You cannot differentiate the heart from the lung. You can't create anything that we create without the membrane differential. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting that in many aspects of science and medicine that we discover kind of like the base substrate material and, um, and that we kind of were ignoring and that we discover how important it is. It's like something like, um, you know, DHEA. Um, you know, DHEA is derived from um, uh, the adrenal system and it's... Um, it's, you know, we call it the mother hormone, the building block for all hormones. It was, used to be thought of for decades as kind of, you know, a residue something. And now we realize that it's a fundamental building block, chemical building block. You know, hyaluronic acid, the substance I told you that I add to vitamin C um, for treating cancer, is the primary molecule that holds water within the cells of the body. If we can stop the loss of water out of the cell through the membrane, the theory is that we can stop aging. We can stop disease altogether. If we can just simply stop the loss of this fluid medium that we lose <laughs> quickly um, from infancy on, we start losing it as soon as we're born. We're losing it. And we lose it through the membrane. So can we start to control the membrane? Stop thinking about 
you know, DHEA or hyaluronic acid or vitamin C or these different biochemical cofactors. Let's talk about the more fundamental component. Um, <clears throat> so the idea that, and one of the things that I believe that happens with RST, with the resonant sound therapy, is the in induction of a process where individuals that I work with start to discover a very interesting phenomenon. And that phenomenon is that we are not our bodies. Our bodies are shells. We are not our bodies. We are something more profound than our bodies. The problem is we're trapped in the body. So let me share this, this image with you. When we're born, just, just kind of indulge me, follow this image. Imagine that the me, the I that exists is a unit of consciousness, a unit of awareness. It enters into the shell of the body. And at birth, what happens is that the fascial membrane that surrounds every muscle, every organ, every blood vessel, every nerve sheath, this fascial membrane in its natural state is completely permeable. Completely permeable. It's permeable to consciousness. And that as soon as we enter the body, something happens through proprioceptive feedback. You've all watched this. Babies discovering their body. You know what it looks like? They take their hands and their feet in their jaw. Uh, pressure, increased sensation, pull away, um, out of focus visual reference point, back, mm, pressure, sensation, increased intensity, pull away, poor visual focus. They keep doing this with their hands and their feet, their hands and their feet, right? Babies I discover the world through their mouth because through the mouth, through this proprioceptive feedback loop, we discover that we are a body. We discover that we are a body. As soon as we discover that we are a body, we start to solidify this membrane, the fascial membrane. And as we solidify it, the hole in the top of our heads starts to slowly seal up. So I just you know, make a reference here about how um, you know, in string theory, 11 dimensions. I mean, what, what in the world are we talking about? 11 dimensions? What does that mean? You know, because in the physical world, we understand four dimensions, right? One, two, three, four. So, you know, a, a line, visually, let's, you know, if, if we look at an M.C. Escher painting, we're seeing something in a, in a two-dimensional plane representing a transition into a three-dimensional object. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a graphic representation of something that's not possible, right? Um, so, you know, so one dimension, two, two dimension, three dimension, what's this? This is referred to as a tesseract. This is a fourth dimensional object. It doesn't exist in our time space. And yet we can make a representation of it, an abstraction of it. So here's a fourth dimensional object, again, represented you know, from a two dimensional plane. We can't create this. We can't make this here. But we can abstract it. It's a mathematical inference. So here we've, we've, you know, Escher has done, given us a, you know, a fourth dimensional projection. You can't climb up the stairs here and here and here and here. You can't do this. And yet there it is. We can see it. So it's an abstraction. So what I believe is that with the resonant sound therapy, the question is, you know, what I'm suggesting is, is very speculative in nature. 
But what I'm also suggesting is there is a way to definitively codify and verify the existence of more than four dimensions um, from an experiential framework. And that as we do this, as we start to wake up the fascial membrane and make it permeable again, that the chi flows unrestricted and the body can start to heal itself. Does healing itself mean that the disease symptoms will go away? No. What I've suggested to you is that the disease symptoms may not go away. Um, and that the work that I do is not about making it go away. It's about helping people wake up into whatever their needs really are. Um, so I've already suggested that, that, the, that the sound is the thing causing the vibration rather than the other way around. In the physical dimension as we understand it, placed in, in, in the framework, you know, that only includes four dimensions, yes. In three space or four yeah. spaces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm suggesting is, is, is that sound comes to us from a place outside simply four dimensional um, conceptualization. Uh, in that's physically audible. So one of the premises of the use of mantra is that a vocal resonance sound becomes a, a vector for the connection into a non-audible but perceivable sound nonetheless. What are, we, what are we hearing if we hear something that cannot be codified with you know, your hearing drum or a machine? What are, are we still hearing it or is it just our imagination? So, you know, Shabda Yoga, yoga there's 12 systems in yoga. And one of them is Shabda Yoga, which is the yoga of the sound current. The premise that it is the sound that is the creating, sustaining force. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that we have, So I talked about the Aum. Um, you know, so, so here we're at this point. You know, so you know, to the mind, it may seem nonsensical or ludicrous um, that a sound that you vocalize has some kind of inherent power, that it can actually do something, because it's just simple sound. And yet, um, the technology that we have with, you know, I mean, think, you know, ultrasound. You know, it's a different band, and from ultrasound, we can see into the If the key is the membrane, the thing that forms the membrane is the sound. So it's the sound that creates the space for something to exist within. So this is a picture. This is Saturn's North Pole. Notice the hexagon here. This is um, a cymatic manifestation generated in, in water. This is um, the use of lycopodium, which is mugwort spores. And so the mugwort is placed on a plate, and then there's a sound frequency generated and, and modulated. And as the sound is generated, it takes on these incredible and interesting geometric characteristics. So here again is, is in water. This is just. Um, this is again in, in the using lycopodium. But you can see that as, as frequencies change, how incredibly diverse the shapes become. Um, and it's interesting that in, you know, we talk about sacred geometry. We talk about um, the phenomenon called mandalas. You're familiar with mandalas? These are, you know, sacred, very complex circular geometric patterns. 
and that these very complex patterns interestingly um, some of these ancient patterns that are that are written and, and demonstrated in in uh, Tibetan and Buddhist texts have these characteristics that they look like these cymatic um, forms because they discovered what we're starting to discover and that is that it's from the inside out that the, the knowledge the awareness the forms come from the inside out so you know you've got to see these in motion to really appreciate you know what these uh, shapes yes just a quick uh, clarification the light podium yeah that's just a medium to display the that's sound. correct yeah, you could. It's just that they're very fine spores, so they allow for a very complex picture. And, and one of the things, um, you know, is, is, and I don't think I have to have a picture. No, I don't think I did there. But this, you know, um, there's a, a video series I really recommend. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Greg Braden's work. But Greg Braden is, is really brilliant. He's a PhD geophysicist. And um, he has a, a video series he calls Awakening to Zero Point. And in it, he has some of the most beautiful cymatic um, you know, representations I've ever seen. But one of them is, is does um, you know, this, that it actually, I mean, as they change the frequency, it starts to create this, this spiral that you would swear you're looking at some astro, you know, physics telescope phenomenon being sped up, that it's, that it's, that it's a spiral nebula. Um, and so there's, there's a body of evidence that's suggesting that maybe, maybe, you know, we do have a deeper understanding of, of what causation really is, where it's coming from. The idea that you know the macrocosm and the microcosm are mirror ir, mirror images of each other, you know that is. Um, I remember when I was a, a you know little kid, there was a black and white um, uh, movie that they I think they showed. You know many of you may have seen it. You know called the Power of Ten. Any of you familiar with that the Power of Ten? You know a, a couple on the beach in, in New York. Um, and they, they, come, they come away from them by a factor of 10 and they keep backing off, backing off until they go out into, deep into the universe. And what, as they go deeper and deeper into the universe, what we have is larger and larger zones of nothing. Big zones of emptiness, then something. Big, big zones of emptiness, then something. Bigger, bigger zones of emptiness, then something. And then they come back brrr, to the beach and now they go through the skin and they do the same thing, tuk, 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 factors of 10. And what they show is first there's something and then there's a zone of emptiness. Then there's something and then there's a bigger zone of emptiness. And then there's something again. And they go by the same number of factors of 10 out into the universe as they do into the subatomic particles. The microcosm and the macrocosm are mirror images of each other. And that physical matter is mostly what? Empty space. Right? Physical matter is mostly empty space. We've been taught, we believe that this dimension, this space, is the most real thing there is. The most real thing there is. But if any of you study modern quantum physics, string theory, it seems that matter is not the most real thing that there is. It's just kind of our experiential framework you know, that we're drawing on. Uh, okay, back up. So, whoop. So, how many of you are familiar with um, Dr. Mendelbrot's work? Um, so, Dr. Mendelbrot is a, a mathematician who identified a, a mathematical formula of binomials that essentially identifies from a purely abstract mathematical perspective, the point at which chaos crosses the membrane into organization. Chaos into organization. <clears throat> and out of it, 
um, comes uh, what are referred to as fractal patterns. Um, so I want to show some of these are going to come up. Mm. Okay. Can we dim the lights a little more? These should be seen in a little better color. <clears throat> so, so this is a fractal. And in the center of the fractal is what's called the Mendelbrot set. Um, so there's the Mendelbrot set. So you can see at the edges <clears throat> that these fractal patterns start to form. And what it is is that it's a sequencing of these Mendelbrots going off into infinity. So what, what I'm about to show you and again, if this was a moving picture, you, you, you know, it's just it's amazing when these are moving. Um, but it's a series of stills, but it's a projection, still to still to still, going deeper into the transition of the set. So that's the edge of that membrane. You can see how it's forming all these baby Mendelbrots, right? And then. There's the Mendelbrots that were on the edge there that have now branched further and further, deeper and deeper. So what happens is when you change one number in the equation of, of the Mendelbrot, it changes the entire visual scope completely dramatically. Um, and um, I, think, I think it's, it's a mathematical abstraction inference of the point where the unmanifest, the uncreated, becomes the created. It's the point, um, and that point is coming from the inside out. It's not, it's not coming from an external space. It's coming from an inside space. What did I do? Did I go, am I going, no, I'm still going out. OK. So, yeah. So, so homeopathy, um, you know, homeopathy is an is a, is a interesting discipline where we take a physical substance and we dilute it. You understand how we make a homeopathic medication, right? How we, we dilute it, and as we dilute it, it becomes stronger. W what? What do you mean? How does that happen? Because we succuss it. What do we mean? We take it and we mechanically vibrate it. We use the modulating frequency to create, to break the energy shell loose so that it works past the physical dimension and from and into the physical dimension. So, um, what happens when I do the resonant sound work with patients is that it seems to manifest the classic homeopathic retracing phenomenon. That symptoms reappear in, in, as, as they existed previously. The, the body starts to heal from the inside out from the top down. But what I've discovered is that the body doesn't just heal from the top down, the body heals out and out is in every direction. So it's not just top down. So sometimes homeopathic physicians use remedies and they keep try trying to drive the sequencing down. But what I've discovered is that we need to stop trying to drive the sequence down. We need to simply allow it to drive out from the inner core. So, you know, it's interesting that, that, I mean, we're, you know, we have, you know, this phenomenon happen, 
happening. You know, our newfound knowledge and competence in epigenetics, physiology, the biochemistry of natural products puts us as well as our patients at risk to place unwarranted power in an external ally. I think external things are really powerful. And I think that there's a focus, and I suspect that this group is prone to do this, is there's a lot of excitement about you know, the new external something, whether it's a new external biochemical thing, herbal thing, energy machine, something that's external. And I just like to have everyone consider that maybe we need to have as much or more emphasis on the internal uh, than just merely uh, the external. So this is, you know, where I shared about, you know, this phenomenon as, you know, how we kind of discover that we're a body. So here is an adult skull. You see how the sutures have filled in. This is a baby skull, right? The, the hole is open. So my contention is the reason that this hole closes is because we start to bind the fascia. We start to wind it up and it pulls and these sutures You know, it's, it's, they have an amazingly interesting fractal type characteristic. I don't think that it's coincidental that, that these sutures, you know, look kind of like a fractal pattern because I think it is this fractal, this phenomenon of, the, you know, this is the place where the physical is being manifest. So as the fascia tightens, um, it closes us in. And I think we can, we can unwind the fascia so that we're not locked in the body anymore. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting question, um, you know, very controversial today, right, about, you know, when does life start? Let me share a, a, a concept with you. What I believe is that until we seal ourselves in the body, that the body is a very complex organic machine. Very complex organic machine. That that which is me, the consciousness that is I, that which we might call soul, doesn't stay until we lock it in. We lock it in. First we discover that we're a body. You know what we discover next? We discover that we're a gender, right? You know what we discover next? We discover that we're a race, a race. You know what we discover next? We discover that we're a language, a language. Then we discover that we're a culture, a society, a family unit, a political or religious affiliation. These are boxes, these are membranes that define who and what we are. And what I believe is that our natural state is a state in which we break free from all of the membranes, all of the forms. And I believe that RST, resonance sound therapy, is a form. It's a form. So one of the premises that I contend talk about in my book is that the way is the way. That the form is not the way. The form may point or lead to the way, but the way is the way because the way is formless. And that every time we put a form around it, whether it's in the form of any organized system of whatever, then what we have done is we've created a box. And the box, by definition, is a limit. It's bounded. And that, so one of the challenges that I make to myself and I make to all of you is when you see the edge of the box, 
step outside. And when you see the edge of the new box, step outside. To keep challenging ourselves to take the layers away. Um, you know what I, what I think I should probably do is, um, as I said, this is the, you're the first group I've done this you know, presentation to, so I think I had about 150 of these slides, and I don't even know how far we've gone. Um, but you know, I'd like to do um, a uh, brief demonstration. Barbara, you want to help us? I have a question for you. Yes, sir. You say that the fascia is a continuous tendon. Right. Is that right? Continuous. Contiguous. Contiguous. Yes. Okay. What happens when somebody has surgery to that? Yeah, that's that's a really great point. So you want to just lay down on, let's see, how about your heads here, your okay. feet are over here for me. Glasses yeah, glasses off. I'll take and yeah, that's. So. Um, yeah. So when there's any surgery or cut or injury, the fascial membrane is severed. So one of the things that I contend is that where the acupuncture meridians lay in the physical body is embedded in the fascial membrane. That's actually where the acupuncture meridians are. That the chakras are embedded in the fascial membrane. And so whenever we cut the membrane in any way, then we're interfering in the flow of chi. So my contention is when we torque the fascial membrane, and we do this by a physical blow, or an emotional blow, or a, a mental blow, or a spiritual blow, or a subconscious blow, and it torques the fascia, it disrupts the positive and negative energy flow, and then it blocks the chi. And where it blocks the chi, we now have a focal zone for an anomaly to manifest a physical, emotional, mental, spiritual symptom that can lead to a disease lead to a disease, so hands by your side. So normally, when I do this, I want to do it, you know, without rubber soles disconnecting me from the earth. I have a problem here. I got a carpet disconnecting me from the earth. So it, it's okay. I mean, it works anyway, but it doesn't work as well. I also have these electronic things on me, and these create a, 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 a pull in the energy field. So one of the things I tell patients is when we do the work is take your jewelry off, take the rings off, take the watches off, take the necklaces off. How many of you go to bed with a ring or necklace around your neck or finger and wear it 24-7? 24-7. Wow. Please, please, please don't do that. Please, take it off when you go to bed. You can wear your wedding band all day. Just take it off when you go to bed because otherwise you create this focal vortex that disrupts the chi at that point. So, so usually what I like to do is start you know, in the abdomen. And what I'm going to ask Barbara to do for me is just make this simple tone. I'm going to give it to you. And, and I want you to continue making this tone. And while you make this tone, I'm going to make a series of complex resonant overtones, which induces a body harmonic that allows the two of us, through proprioceptive feedback together, to find the fascial membrane and to start to unwind it and let the chi flow through. So. Um, Breathe, yeah, breathe as you want to breathe. Okay. So, so as I do this, I, I often share a little bit of information with the patient. So I ask you to continue the tone, and, and even though I may stop and talk, even though I'm talking. So I'm going to kind of give you an example of a little bit of how I do this clinically in the office. Um, and my request is that the cameras have to go off at this point, that, that, that this part's not to be recorded. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great analogy because I think, I think it is. Um, I think that, um, I mean, as I do this, what happens is that 
I start to tactily feel the meridians and, and then visually see them. I mean, it's like I start to actually see energy in the body that we can't see. Yeah. Is that uh, something that other practitioners can learn? I think so. I think so. I mean, my, my hope with this work is that I, I really believe that it's, that it's reproducible, that it's replicatable, that it's teachable, um, and that I can, I can take this, um, and that's what I'm, you know, I'm trying to develop a, um, you know, a program that I'm going to, you know, do postgraduate seminar work with people. Um, but the truth is, is my intention is I, I have a vision of doing this at a lay level with people who just simply want to do things to help their own health. And then I want to do it um, with primarily with body workers. People who work with the body, whether it be acupuncturists or massage therapists or rolfers, the truth is, is that most physicians aren't very good candidates necessarily for this work because they are not body workers. And I'll tell you that a good percentage of my naturopathic colleagues are not body workers. Um, so, I mean, the first workshop I'm going to do, I'm actually going to do for a massage school in Tucson. Um, and then I'm going to do one for the acupuncture school in Tucson. Um, and, um, but, you know, my intention is to kind of open the doors for uh, anybody because the truth is, is that we all have this inherent ability and capacity to open ourselves to this energy stream to help ourselves and to help each other. Now, if somebody were to study acupuncture, yeah. um, they'll learn that there are X number of conditions that you can try to treat. Mm -hmm. Now, if you try to treat with your technique any of those, do you find that you're getting greater success, same success, no success? So, so, what's been, so first of all, if you're not aware, acupuncture is a cohesive system of medicine that can be used to treat anything, anything without limit of any kind. Um, it's not just used for musculoskeletal problems or nerve injury. It's used for any physical, emotional, mental condition that there is. Um, it's about opening chi. And so this is a system about opening chi. And um, r you know, from a didactic standpoint, I mean, I can take people and we could spend um, you know, months learning the acupuncture meridians and all the points and all the muscles and all the nerves and all the things that physicians learn. And I have no interest in doing that because what I understand from my own experience is that this work is, I mean, how did the first people discover the acupuncture meridians? How did they discover them? I'll tell you, you know how? From the inside out. They intuited, they simply trusted and started to find and feel and utilize. How did we first discover the use of healing plants. How? Who discovered it? How did they discover it? Some of the anthropological literature suggests that, well, they ate stuff and experimented. Well, let me tell you, that's wrong. That is the way people who are disconnected from their hearts and nature and Mother Earth are doing it and playing with it. But our more primal fundamental selves started to understand how to use plants by communicating with them and the plants communicating back. Let me, let me, let me share a couple of little, just a couple tidbits you know, from my book that I think are, are rather dramatic and, and a really different angle. And I really want you to you know, kind of use it as a, maybe a contemplation seed and see where you go with it. So get this image. Humans in the human state of consciousness are the lowest life form on the planet. The lowest life form on the planet. Why do I say that? Well, let me give you this definition. The capacity of the organism to live in harmony 
with itself, its own species, and all other organisms on the planet. Based on that criteria, insects are a higher life form than humans. You with me? Based on that criteria. We're not talking about individual humans. We're not talking about humans that may be more enlightened or that are enlightened. We're talking about humans in the human state of consciousness as they function on planet Earth today in modern times. Based on that criteria, insects are a higher life form. So based on that criteria, animals, higher life form. Based on that criteria, plants, are a much higher life form. The capacity to live in harmony with themselves, their own species, and all other organisms on the planet. Wow, plants, they've got it down. And where do they go to get what they need? Boom, right where they are. From Mother Earth, Father Sky, right where they are. They need go nowhere. They need seek nothing. <clears throat> because they know what they need is right where they are. Well, this is a spiritual premise that is taught in all of the spiritual traditions that we live in this moment. That there is no past, the past is only a memory. There is no future, the future is only a projection of a possibility. We live in this moment, and in this moment there is no disease. In this moment there is no pain, suffering. The only way we create those things because I contend we are the co-creators. The way we create those things is we take an image coupled with an emotional charge and we keep playing that image. So one of the things when I do this work with patients is that images come up. You know, when I'm working on a frozen shoulder or a twisted neck or, you know, um, an ulcerative, you know, belly, images come up, memories come up, right? And so what I say is this, and this is an exercise I want to give all of you. Consider this exercise. Take your life, play it from your birth forward like a movie screen. And as you play it forward, as you play it forward, look for any images that have an emotional hook. An emotional hook. That is anger, sadness, fear, right? An emotional hook. And where those images come up, freeze frame it and then loop it. Take that one piece of the picture of your life and loop it. And as you loop it, as you loop it, remember this fact. The image that you are projecting in your own mind's eye, that you are projecting from your own consciousness or your own subconscious, the image that you are creating is a memory or a projection. What did I just say? We live in this moment. There is no past. The past is only a memory. There is no future. The future is a projection of a possibility. In this moment, you can't have any of that unless you hold it there. And you know where, how we hold it there? With our cortex. So let me tell you this other interesting idea. We believe as humans that the reason that we are the highest life form on the planet is because of our cortex. You understand that our cortex is significantly larger than any other animal species on the planet. Well, let me, let me give you a secret. The cortex is not the part of the human body that makes us superior to every other organism on the planet. It is the thing that makes us inferior. Inferior. Because through the cortex, we can place ourselves in space-time. We can place ourselves in space-time and we can project and remember the past and project possibilities. And through that, through that, we, we lock ourselves, we torque the fascia, we block the chi, we create physical, emotional, mental, spiritual aberrations, diseases. So what I've discovered is a way using, I use essential oils. Follow this image. If plants are a higher life form, then the flower of the plant is the highest consciousness within the plant. And the essence of the flower is spirit made manifest in the physical domain. It is the way plants communicate their consciousness to us. And so consider that 
if we take a plant and instead of simply you know what we do in the human state you know what we do we take whatever we want right because we are the lords of the universe we take plants we grind them up and chomp them down in our mouth you know with our feet with rubber soles and and metal spoons and utensils we wonder why we get sick i mean we're raping the plants and the animals where we're i mean let's go back to american indian tradition you know these organisms are sacred and we need to ask their permission so what i do is i bring plants into the space with patients and i've discovered that through the olfactory bulb which is connected directly to the limbic system which is the core of our neuroendocrine function and our emotional center that we use the essence of the plant coupled with the resonant sound and the modulating frequency to bypass the cortex bypass the cortex through the thalamus through the cerebellum into the brain stem our brain stem is our primal self our brain stem is where instinct resides instinct we instinct is divine connection the animals already have it right instinct divine connection they don't need to think about going outside you know or or when when there's going to be a tornado or an earthquake they just know right they just know and humans we have this capacity so don't misunderstand me in the human state humans are the lowest life form but we have the potential we have the potential of the plants and the animals we have that potential and if we use the plants and the animals as our allies in this journey then they will guide us and teach us so i've discovered how to how to let these plants and animals help us and how to help how to teach people how to start to make these connections again in their life um when you eat your food try this feet on the ground with your hands in the privacy of your home you can do it in the privacy of your home turn every bite into liquid every bite and as you chew and feel the fibers breaking apart express the gratitude to the plant or the animal for surrendering its life force for your existence it's a gift that it's giving us to sustain us and we do it without a second thought or we do it quote you know in the name of god it's like thank you god it's like <laughs> I, i'm sorry it's like i mean yes sir i have an idea if i go to an internist why i'm going there yeah but why would somebody want to try your therapy what type of symptoms virtually anything so 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 let me just share a couple of of little brief case histories um before i started doing this work <clears throat> i would have told you as a physician that there is an absolute glass ceiling that there are certain medical conditions or stages of pathology which are irreversible barring divine intervention barring divine intervention there are certain levels of pathology that's it well since i've been doing this work i can no longer tell you where the glass ceiling is i can't tell you i have um a woman um that with osteonecrosis um this is you know a condition where we don't know nobody knows why the bones are destroying themselves but they're basically destroying themselves and um uh, and what the allopathic uh, medicine offers is gradual replacement of the knees the hips the shoulders the elbows whatever gradual replacement until they can't replace anything anymore because it's just too much so and it's irreversible so i have a patient i did three treatments came to me from uh back east we did three sessions of rst she went back to harvard medical um school where they diagnosed her and told her she was incurable and they said she doesn't have it anymore i mean 
I, I don't know what that is. I mean, when I do this work, it's not about curing or reversing disease. It's about letting the chi flow through. I have a gentleman with advanced cerebral palsy. Have any of you people seen a cerebral palsy patient? They, they do this. Their bodies deform. And it's the bones. The bones actually are deformed. And they can't, I mean, they're frozen in their body. It's, it's a horrible disease. Horrible disease. So um, this gentleman that I've been working with, um, for the first time in his life, he's, um, you know, when we're working in a session, we've been able to get his body actually completely straight, laying on the table, back flat, arms flat, and it is not physically possible. It's not physically possible because the bones are deformed. What's amazing about this gentleman is when I leave, it's like it comes back. You know, I was, I was talking with Mike about, uh, about this because he's, he's got a, you know, a, a little problem that's been there for 10 years. And he said, Lance, you know, if we do this, is, what's, what's it going to take to get rid of this? And I said, well, all it takes is one treatment for anything. All it takes is one treatment. There's only one catch. And the catch is, is that, that I can get the body to recognize that the chi is flowing unrestricted and open up all the pathways and all the chakras and all the meridians. And then you get up off the table and you remember the cortex. See, the cortex. See what it did? The cortex remembers, well, but I have arthritis, <laughs> and I can't possibly not be, have pain. I can't possibly open my hand or close it. So because of that memory, it's called an engram. We basically lock ourselves into the old pattern. And you say, well, yeah, but I didn't do it. You know, it's like I, I'm a victim of it. Not in, not in the universe that I practice in. No, we're not victims of anything. None of us. Not a victim of anything at all. We are the creators. And we create what we create. And we create these engrams. And the amazing thing is that we can, we can back out of it. We can unwind it. It's, um, I have a woman who is um, spinal cord injury. She's been paralyzed for 25 years. And um, for the first time in 25 years, she's demonstrating um, a small amount of um, control of you know, hands and extremities. I mean, she can actually, you can, you, know, you, can, you can get her to respond to have physical motion, spinal cord injury. And for the first time in 25 years, she's talking in short sentences. She has been completely incapable of talking for 25 years. So I don't know where the ceiling is. I don't know what's possible. And, and we're not trying to reverse something. I'm not doing this thinking, OK, now you're going to talk now. Or you're going to all of a sudden be able to walk. What I'm doing is <clears throat> recognizing this fact. We live in this moment. There is no past, there is no future. In this moment, perfect blueprint. Are you with me? Perfect blueprint. Superimpose it on the physical. Superimpose it on the emotional. Superimpose it on the mental, the subconscious. Superimpose it because that's what is. That's what is. And everything else is our own illusion, our own delusion that we've created. Um, I was coming here with Mike this evening, and we were in the car with a friend talking about, um, um, you know, some of the earth changes, you know, that are being proposed. And, and I, suggested, I suggested this interesting concept. We are the co-creators. We create by taking an image and coupling it with an emotional charge. Why would any of us ever look in the mirror for ourselves or for anyone else and see a negative image with a negative emotional content? Why do we do that as humans? Do you get me? Why do we do that? 
That's crazy. But we do it all day long. We look at ourselves, or we look at our friends, our relatives, and we acknowledge, oh, you have cancer, you have diabetes, you know, oh, oh, and we, our hearts reach out. And what we see in our mind's eye is we see our loved one with the very disease that neither they nor we want. Why do we choose that? Well, because it's there. You can't say it's not there. Well, I'm not suggesting that we all start to live in a rosy world of denial. What I'm suggesting is that we have self-conscious power to choose the images in our own mind's eye, to choose the images. Um, and why not choose an image that's unconditional? So what I say to patients when I tell them to play their life, so get the, this is the homework piece. You play your life, you find the images that have an emotional hook, freeze frame it, loop it, loop it, loop it, recognize that it's a memory or a projection, it has no power, has no reality, has no power, no reality, it's a memory or a projection. And then overlay on it this image, see yourself in the mirror, see everybody, see everything unconditionally, grateful, in harmony, in balance, content, fulfilled, in joy, in joy, in joy, in joy, in joy, in joy. See yourself, see everyone unconditionally, grateful, in harmony, in balance, content, fulfilled, in joy, in joy, in joy, in joy. And get this, no specificity. You understand what I'm saying? No specificity. You don't hold yourself or others with, well, what I'm going to see then is that my son-in-law gets that new job. Oh yeah, that's the image I want for him. Or, you know, my daughter, you know, is going to marry that guy she met that's so nice and they're going to be such a great couple and she's going to get him, you know, and it's going to be wonderful. Uh-uh. No, no. That's called white magic. Don't go there. It's called white magic, okay? Uh, no specificity. Harmony. Harmony. Don't, don't give it a detail. Let's, we are conduits. Spirit flows through us. Let it flow through. Let it form itself. Don't form it for it. Let it form itself. Okay? So. Is your program recognized by, say, the VA or Stanford or the <clears throat> insurance plan? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm a naturopathic physician. I'm a board certified naturopathic physician. Um, do insurance companies pay for naturopathic medicine? The federal government does not recognize naturopathic medicine or any other medicine practiced alternatively by any category or class of physician or practitioner, period. Now, um, so does Medicare or Medicaid pay for anything I do? Guaranteed no. Does private insurance pay? Sometimes. In Arizona, most people are members of an HMO. HMOs don't pay because we're not members of HMOs. But if it's a PPO, you understand, you can go outside of the network. And so you can get services, but um, you can't, you know, if I give you an herb, your insurance is not going to pay for it. Um, and um, so, you know, this energy work, because it's a physical modality therapy, you know, might insurance reimburse for some of it? Maybe. They might. They might. Yes, sir. You know, when you said something before about the spiral nebula looking like one of these pictures, yeah. I thought to myself, you know, we can't listen to what's going on out there. But maybe the whole nebula is controlled by sound rather than light or physical, some physical arrangement. Right. So unless we can understand what it is we are doing, we may not be able to benefit from this. We have to understand the whole process. Except, let me share this. And, and you know, it gets, it gets tricky because what I believe is that when I say from the inside out and the way that we get this is outside the reference of the cortex. We want so desperately to understand with our mind and I want you to get it that the mind is a trap. The mind is a trap. We can only use it so far, and then we've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. It's like a Zen koan. 
you understand the function of a Zen koan? The sound of one hand clapping. <laughs> what does your mind do with that? <laughs> Nothing. Your mind can't figure it out. It can't solve it because it's not a puzzle for the mind to get. So, so um, think about this. Our cortex is the part of the brain that has allowed us to create all of the incredible and wondrous and miraculous technology, the airplanes and the cars and wow, it's incredible and the, and the cameras and the, the computers and wow, it's awesome. Think about this. This technology created from our mind, has it in any way improved our capacity as humans to live in harmony with ourselves, our own species, or any other organisms on the planet? No. Not a drop. Not a drop. Okay, it's very cool stuff. But the answer isn't technology. The answer is in our hearts. The answer is in our souls. The answer is grounding ourselves back to the earth. Because we are the children of Gaia. You know the concept Gaia? Our mother. She is a living planet. She is a living consciousness. We are her children. She is our creator. The planet is our creator. She is our mother. We have to remember and hook back with her. We've disconnected. You know, the way to get solve this stuff, the, the environment and pollution and health, is to just connect back to our mother. And it's not technology. So, so in, in my book, you know, I elucidate on this idea of how do, we, how do we step outside the mind? How do we get it that the cortex isn't the answer? How do we get it that humans really are the lowest life form? That we put ourselves in context. See, we got it backwards. We think that it's it's rocks, you know, it's, it's minerals, and then vegetables, and then animals, and then humans, right? That's, we were all taught this. This is the way, this is evolution, right? Backwards, it's backwards. It's, no, no, humans are the bottom, and then you've got animals, you've got, you got, humans are the bottom, then you've got insects, then you've got animals, then you've got plants, and then, get this kicker, gemstones. Precious gemstones, unbelievable consciousness. So, so one of the things I do clinically is I work with the plant essences and the gemstones and invite the consciousness and spirits of these illuminated beings to come and join us in the party. And I don't do that with everyone because some people aren't ready for that. That's a little too shamanic, right? That's a little too woo-woo, except, <laughs> except that I really believe there is a, an essential scientific foundation for this. That what I'm talking about, the way I describe it and write about it and teach about it, is, is I mean, what I think I've done, you know, and, and, and time, will, time will tell, but what I think I've done is actually created a functional unified field theory that explains it all. Explains it all. Yes, sir. Lance, I'd like to offer something very practical I learned about 25 years ago. Great. Yeah. All day long, I couldn't figure it out. The next day, nobody got shocked. And the machine seemed half as powerful. And I scratched my head and I realized I was wearing leather soled shoes the first day. Uh. So then I buy the grounding plate. This is at like a health show. Yeah. I had people stand under this thing and uh, their hair would plastic <laughs> down. And they would just grow in 10 seconds. And I finally put up a sign that said, Migraine headaches gone in 10 seconds, guaranteed. It got a line 30 people long. <laughs> the Chinook winds were blowing out of a, into Calgary there. And people said, I went down the line and people, you know, believe that, that these simple little gold-plated little things, you know, the electron charge can do that. So I said, my God, well, people should not be wearing rubber. And I realized all the people I was shocking were, everyone had rubber gold shoes. Yeah. So from that day forward, every time I bought a pair of shoes, I'd immediately drill a hole through the bottom, <laughs> put a piece of copper in there, bend it over, and no <laughs> copper pipe against the wall, bend it like this. And then I immediately took out the phthalate containing highly toxic foam cushioning inside, threw that away, and threw in <laughs> layers of leather inside. So yeah. when I walked down the street, I'm completely grown. I love it. By just simply 
So, so let, let me tell you something about leather though because you know when I started doing this work and it's like I'd be wearing my rubber soled shoes in my office and I'd go oh, I, 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 just, I can't it's like I'd get it, it wouldn't work you know and I'd have my cell phone on and I'd have to like rip it off you know and you know I am happily married for 35 years I cannot wear my wedding band I can't wear it I can't I mean you know I, I used to be able to, but I mean, it's not just taking it off at night. I just can't wear it. I can't have a metal band around any part of my body. It's like, I feel like I'm being murdered, you know, if I put something fully metal, you know. So I tell people, take your necklaces, take that beautiful gold thing, put it on leather, put it on something other than metal, you know, um, and at least minimally take the stuff off at night, you know, all the way off. But so what I, one of the things I, I figured out, because, you know, I'm clever, I figured the answer, moccasins, right? Moccasins is the answer because, I mean, that's what the native people use. Well, no, get this image. What is a moccasin made of? Leather. Sk leather. It's skin. It's skin. So the fascia, the fascial membrane, how do we freeze ourselves in the body? The fascia, it goes solidifies, and it holds us in. So we've killed this animal, usually violently. It didn't die a happy way. It wasn't, it wasn't like content as it died. And we take its skin, it's now dead skin, it's frozen fascia. The energy is completely frozen, wow. I have these beautiful moccasins, I would put them on, take them to work, and try to do this work on patients with the moccasins. It, I, felt, I felt like there were these these balloons blowing up in my feet. I, it turned red hot. It's like it was worse than the rubber. <laughs> so I don't quite understand. I mean, because it, it seems like that should work. Now, maybe there's some way to treat the leather. There's some way to treat it. But when it's solid leather all the way around the front, back, bottom, all the way, it's like a fascial sock that freezes you. I mean, it was the worst thing imaginable. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that I've discovered over the couple of years that I've been doing this more clinically is, is, is this principle. The way is the way. The form is not the way. The form can lead or point to the way, but the form is not the way. Master the form. Master the form. Utilize the form, but then release it because the form is not the way. The way is the way. RST is a form. Every clinical technique is a, is a form, and the form is only a tool. So what I've been discovering is that the character of the form of RST over the last two years has been expanding, expanding, expanding. I used to get it that the way that she flows is through the earth, through our feet in a double helix, through the top of the head, through the meridians and through the chakras, right? Well, what happens when I lay a patient down on a table horizontally? The chi isn't flowing from the earth through their feet. So how is it flowing? It's like you know, I realized it's like, wait a minute, there's a disconnect here. So what I discovered is that we are not the body. The body is just a shell. You know what our form is? Our natural form is a sphere. We are a sphere. And from the center of the sphere, follow this image with me. We are in the core of the sphere. And from the center, we can look out 360 degrees in every direction. And in the distance, we see the transparent membrane, the edge of the sphere, the very edge, transparent membrane. So from the core, double helix of white light, one side is spinning out from the core to the periphery. At the same time, the other side is spiraling back from the periphery to the core. 360 degrees, every direction, every direction. You, you take away north, south, east, west, up, down. You take it all away because we're at the center of this space and that's our natural state. That's when the membrane becomes totally permeable. So, so over the last couple years, my perception and visualization and awareness of what I'm doing and how I'm doing it has continued to change and kind of unfold from the inside out. Part of this, as, as in the self-help mode, you know, you've noticed, I, you know, that I, I, I often start, you know, doing this, this motion. It's like, you know, 
I have never studied martial arts or Tai Chi or Qigong uh, in any form, but I, I have a form that you know, I teach people. So let me show you. It looks, it looks like this. Anyone who wants to try this to join me, um, you, know, you, can, you can stand up and try this. You stand with your feet facing forward a little wider than your shoulders. You sit just into yourself right here. You kind of take your feet and just flatten them on the ground. Elbows, shoulder to elbow against your sides, counterclockwise. Start to make a spiral from the pelvis. I take the spiral here, the circle, and then I turn it into figure eight. Up, down, around, up, down, around, up, down, around. When you start to do this figure eight, when you start to do this figure eight infinity, you start to feel your fingers tingling. You start to feel your fingers tingling. This is the chi. This is the life force coming through. And then I have people hold the ball. Ha! Hold the ball. Ha! White light. Compress it. Feel it. See it. And then overdrive the edge of the ball. See, I'm just over the edge, over the edge, over the edge. I keep going over the edge, over the edge, further until I take the figure eight into this plane. So now, from horizontal, I've taken it vertical. Right? I've taken it vertical. But now watch this. Right up here, I slow it down. And now I'm going to take it out of the vertical, out of the horizontal. I'm going to start to mix and match. Start to mix and match. And I'm not thinking about it. I'm just letting it happen. Letting it happen, letting it happen, letting it happen. It's kind of stretching it out, stretching it out more. And then what happens though, if you start to speed it up, it, you come into, into the spiral, into the double helix, because that's, that's what it's doing. And so when you look at Tai Chi or Qigong or other martial arts, what they do is they do this, and then they phase back this, phase back, shift, phase back, shift, phase, 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 and you don't see whew, the spiral. You don't see the continuity because they don't show it to you. But in fact, everything they're doing is this. So, so, I show, so what I tell people to get the simple form of this is this. It's, a half, it's half circles, right? Half circle, half circle, top, cup, you know, half circles. You know, that's just, just take little half circles, you know, and let them, let them go. Let them go. Don't think about them. Just let them, let them happen. Just let them start to happen in any direction. And you can do it slow or fast. You just kind of let it, let it happen. But the other thing I teach is what I call hard form. Get this. This is, this is fun and this is really simple. We are not the body. The body is just a shell. So feel it all anymore. See, we, but how did you feel it all? Well, you, when you, what happens is you've just plugged in, ding, into the chi circuit, into the life circuit. This is the life force. You've just plugged it in, okay? And what's happened is we've stretched the fascia right under the skin. We've stretched the fascia. And because we've stretched the fascia, we now feel every part of it. So watch this. I take this same tension from here up, to my elbow, up to my shoulder, and see what starts to happen to my body. To do it, I've got to pull the whole body. And now I'm going to take it down this line, out to my foot into the ground. To do it, I have to bring my foot up. It has to curl up. If I try to do it flat-footed, I can't, I can't make it come up. I've got to curl it up to bring it up. Now, there's a continuous stream of chi flowing through the earth, through my foot, through the leg, right out here, and back, and out and back. But now, I'm going to stretch it. Uh, uh, everywhere uh, at the same time. Uh, so it's around every muscle, uh, around the surface, under the skin. So now, the same sensation that I could feel in one hand, 
Now I feel my entire body. I feel the bottoms of my feet to the top of my head. I feel my entire body. And now uh, I'm going to take it in, in deeper, 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 deeper through the ligaments, deeper, deeper, deeper through the organs. So in martial arts, which I don't practice, never have, and don't know anything about it, but they talk about like iron fist. They talk, you see that, you know, they take a metal spear. They take the tip of the spear and, and push it against somebody's chest and bend it. And it doesn't penetrate. You know how they can do that? You know why they do that? Because they have learned to control the fascia. They have learned to control the fascia. They can liquefy or solidify, liquefy or solidify any part of the fascia at will. Interestingly, most of them can't explain that that's what they're doing or even how they do it. But it's not that hard. You know, what I believe I've created is a system that can be taught easily to people, um, you know, to learn some of these basic motions. If you can get this chi flowing regularly and, and ground yourself on the earth, drink lots of fresh water and eat with your hands and be grateful and convert it to liquid in your mouth. I believe you can probably cure 99% of everything on the planet. I really do. I mean, those things, if we would just do that, chew it, ground ourselves, figure out how to start to get this energy moving. So the other piece of homework that I challenge all of you with is every day, go outside, barefoot, stand on the earth, and sing and dance. Sing and dance. You know, it doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be this weird circle and eight and ball and that crap. Just, yeah. just sing and dance. <laughs> yeah, and you don't even have to take drugs. It's just sing and dance. <laughs> huh? Tile is okay. See, tile is the earth. And the reason, see, think about this. Our houses, our buildings, it's a cement slab. Right, it's a cement slab, but mostly, mostly for most of us it is a cement slab. But if it's tile or wood, it goes right to the edge of the slab. And so the earth, the chi from the earth, it jumps it. It jumps right onto the surface. So the entire wood or tile floor is grounded. But if it's, if it's just cement or brick, and if, you know, it, it, it's, it's it got to be careful. I mean, brick that's just clay, yeah, is okay. You can use brick. But if it's cement, you got to be careful. It tends to disconnect us, you know. Um, so, because, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a little cold to be going out there barefoot, you know. But, uh, but if you, you know, got a little tile in the bathroom, you know. Oops, I think I'm being, I think I'm being told I better shut up. <laughs> Next month is Steve Fouts talking on Alzheimer's and dementia. So you have to remember it. <laughs>
uh, continuing education for medical professionals, keeping women healthy. Actually, the rest of it is keeping women healthy in their reproductive years, so you can think of your thoughts. Thank you. I want to especially thank Don for allowing me to come tonight and just have a word before you all. Um, I'm with the California Catholic Women's Forum, and we are a small independent group of registered nurses. There's seven on our board. And for the last year and a half, we've been giving continuing education courses to nurses and physicians on matters to do with women's health. In particular, we're looking at reproductive health. And uh, I had a minute to look at your website before I came here tonight. There was a phrase there that really caught my eye because it sounds so similar to what uh, we're trying to do. You have on your mission that you provide credible health education to the public with an emphasis on optimal wellness. And I would say our group does the same thing, but we emphasize optimal wellness for women. Um, we are <clears throat> looking at issues such as hormone use, both during the reproductive years and during menopause. We're also um, studying assisted reproductive technologies, all the different ramifications we have for uh, women's health. And our next conference, which will be held in January, at the end of uh, the month, is looking at the connection between abortion there's been a lot in the news about breast cancer. We know it's a skyrocketing problem with women. And this Dr. Angela Lanfranchi, who is an expert in the subject, comes to us from the East Coast to talk about the fact that there has been a link demonstrated between an abortion, particularly of a first pregnancy, and a change in the woman's physiology of the breast that can lead to a higher incidence of cancer. So, Again, we're looking at that kind of under-the-radar type of medical information to empower women to uh, make healthy choices for themselves. If you have any more questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. We have a set of flyers. Looks like there's none left, but I have some more if you're interested. Uh, again, it's January 31st. Continuing education credits for both nurses and doctors, but we're uh, open to the public, so any layperson can attend. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. I was just speaking to Dave Asprey, who had an amazing experience this, this month about uh, something to do with the brain. He'll be telling us about it now. Uh, I have five minutes? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, before I talk about the brain stuff, I've got to explain my funky shades. It's my quest to be a rock star. Uh, now, what it is, these are prescription Erlen lenses. I figured out that fluorescent lights completely tweak on me. I didn't realize this, but they do it to a lot of people. There's ties to lupus and whatnot. So I went to a doctor who actually um, does color testing. You look through a bunch of different lenses and find the ones that work best. This was the color that worked for me. When I wear these, I am about twice as energetic as I normally am. I've never been this productive at work in my life, and I look cool. So, that's one thing, I-R-L-E-N, and the name of the thing with, with fluorescent lights is called Scoptic Sensitivity, S-C-O-P-T-I-C. -C. It's still disputed by some um, of the more, tra or more uh, Western-oriented doctors, uh, who I will not call traditional medicine. Uh, but uh, it really works for me. So that was the first thing. Second thing, I went to an institute in Canada and spent a week doing a very advanced EEG biofeedback. EEG biofeedback, some of you may be aware, is a type of uh, sort of treatment that can affect you in lots of different ways. Um, it can affect um, your alertness levels, it can affect blood flow to the brain. Interestingly, the guy who invented this, who's named Dr. Jim Hart, has proven, uh, he's an ex-UCSF uh, psychologist um, who does work with NHF grants, has proven that it increases blood flow to the brain dramatically in one week. So the other side effects that it does 
it teaches you to have brain waves that are the same as an advanced Zen meditator in one week. It takes between 21 and 40 years to achieve that brain state if you do it the old-fashioned way, which involves sitting a lot and chanting. Um, which, I, by the way, I've also done, um, but not for that long. I'm barely that old. So, um, end results, I, I did this. Um, oh, the other side effect of the Zen meditation is it raises your IQ an average of 12 points and your creativity by 50%, and those numbers come from Stanford Research Institute, or SRI, as well as a large study that was done on uh, the entire employee base of a greeting card company. So I went up and did this and found profound changes in my health in one week, uh, to the point that uh, my alertness level is I'm far more alert than I was before. Not that it was ever that big of a problem, but it's a very different thing. And a lot of very interesting emotional changes that reflected themselves in my physical health. So it was a, a remarkable experience. If anyone's interested in just reading about this type of research, I would recommend a book published in 2007 called The Art of Smart Thinking. The name of the author is Dr. Jim Hart, H-A-R-D-T. Very, very interesting read. In the book, he talks about a group of ladies in their 70s and early 80s who underwent one week of training. When he was done, one of them, who was 80, took a lover who was 50. Another of them, another of them got a, a college degree and started a business, and another one became a successful businesswoman as well. So completely rejuvenating people in a week. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of room for research with this technology. Uh, very fascinating stuff. And on a personal level, I found it to be remarkably profound and just uh, opened me on a lot of different levels I hadn't quite, um, quite uh, felt before, even though I at least read about them. So, interesting experience. The institute is called BioCyberNot. It's very uh, out there. B I O C Y B E R N A U T. Uh, BioCyberNot.com. Is that a question? No? Will you spell that again? I would write it up here. It's not there. Bio, um, B I O, Cyber. C Y B E R, not like astronaut, N A U T dot com. Question, you have a question back there. Uh, do I? Is it a question or just a hello? I think it was a hello. Was, that was There's no question. What is the relation between this study, we study, and what's going on at UCF and Stanford? Uh, and what's the relation? Um, the question is, what's going on with this and UCSF's program for upgrading your brain? I'm asking what the latest oh. I don't know the work at UCSF that's happening today. Uh, Dr. Hart left UCSF uh, sometime in the mid to late 80s um, because, well, he found that there were um, changes on, um, like schizophrenics were cured in about a week, sometimes two weeks, and that didn't agree with traditional Western kind of thinking that that was possible. So uh, he basically left frustrated and went off and did it as a private company. Uh, I don't know what uh, UCSF is doing now, but if there's anything about brain upgrades, uh, I have like every device I can find and every uh, book I can find, so I'll look that one up. Other questions? Um, I think I'm running out of five minutes anyway, so oh, there's another question. Erlen, I-R-L-E-N, is, uh, by the way, the question was, uh, what about those weird glasses you're wearing? Um, I-R-L-E-N is the name of the institute that figured this stuff out. It turns out it's also a very effective for learning disabilities in kids. Um, there's also um, Scoptic, S-C-O-P-T-I-C, like scope with no E, and then TIC, T-I-C, Scoptic sensitivity is the name of that condition. Just a quick comment, I teach middle school and uh, the students, I'm teaching remedial reading, a lot of learning disabilities and issues they always want the lights out in the classroom, and there always are fluorescent lights in our classrooms. And I have a theory about that. They, they learn better when those lights are off. Um, the, the, the comment was that she's, she's discovered in middle school teaching that students learn better with the fluorescent lights off. I can tell you in where I work, about 10% of people unplug the fluorescent lights above their cubes, including me, and I have for years because I hate the things. What I didn't know is that when I look down at a sheet of white paper under fluorescence, the words actually have big halos that sort of move around. I'd learned to tune out and not see that, but once I started looking at it, oh my god, no wonder I don't feel good when I'm under these things. Uh, but with these things, I'm fine. 
So if, if that's a problem for you, feel, if you feel tired at Walmart, it's the lights, not the air. <laughs> yeah, I like to offer uh, Dave the uh, when because I used to write articles about light, fluorescent lights, and different types of lighting and so forth. And uh, big changes started happening when they switched to the 32 watt high frequency electronic ballast, which took your 60 cycle flicker factor, I called it, meaning going on and off 120 times a second, where you'd see after images sometimes when you were tired, when you were writing across a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And they found out the kids got tired, and they, then they switched to this high frequency 20 to 50,000 cycles and by a Motorola engineer. Suddenly it was as though you were under a skylight with the full spectrum light. That's why they have triphosphor coatings in them and so forth. So that has been shown to not be as uh, harmful as, as, of course, the old fluorescent lights. If they're fat tubes, get rid of them. That's what I tell people. Mm -hmm. Can you buy that What's the name of the doctor that you went to to get the color uh, The name of the doctor, I have already forgotten. Uh, he was in Walnut Creek. If you go to Erlin Institute and you look on their website, he's the closest in the Bay Area. What are those lights you're talking about? Uh, well, these, the new fixtures basically just have new ballast, so you can retrofit. Uh, I did a whole artist studio one, you can retrofit all the lights. Uh, this. Um, you just go to your uh, lighting supply store and ask for high frequency electronic ballast. Look in there and see what, whether you have a, uh, uh, which type of ballast it is. And then you'll get that version and the high frequency type. There's also a filter you can buy called Thermolux um, that goes on top of the bulb that filters out one of the frequencies that's annoying. Uh, I haven't bought them yet, but I've talked to the CEO of the company and uh, it seems pretty credible. I'm going to try and get those installed at the public company where I work to see maybe in one floor whether we have you know better results on that floor than the other floors. It'll be my floor, of course. Well, it's nice that that uh, talk fit in with our title of our group, Smart Life Forum. It's nice to know there are things that can make you even smarter. Uh, is there anyone else here that was supposed to give a uh, short talk? I guess not. I think we have 10 minutes to uh, open it up to any comments, new developments, anything you've seen. Anybody here that uh, else? First, every month, I, every month I like to uh, remind people that if you're new, remember to check our website. Can't hear you. you can't hear me. Okay. God darn. Maybe you should be talking. Um, SmartLifeForum.org is our website, and listed there are the, gee whiz, at least over 88 speakers that we've had. This will be my 88th video I've done here, as long as the listing of all the videos that you can get. And I highly recommend you get last month's John Gray if you were not here, because. Uh, it's something you can take home, copy, give it to your friends, and it's all about relationships between males and females, and we all have either or both in our lives, so uh, that's available there, and also the list of all the other videos for sale. Thank you very much. Uh, Stan? Yeah, a um, couple of things. One, uh, if you get Jonathan Wright's uh, newsletter, uh, his last newsletter, he uh, talks about the electromagnetic spectrum and uh, radio frequencies and and how they damage the body. And if you recall, about, what was it, a year, a year and a half ago, we have Professor Graham and Dave Stetson here. The whole article, whole three pages in Dr. Wright's newsletter, is about how these frequencies, not just fluorescence, but they affect it too, impact your system. And he refers strictly to the, um, the work that Stetson and Graham did. I know that back then, we were the first ones that were introduced to that, and there was a lot of questions about whether this is real or not real, but now it's becoming more public knowledge. Another simple thing is that we talk about vitamin B a lot, and uh, you know, I went to a, a, a kidney doctor, and I didn't realize now they're getting involved with vitamin D, because vitamin D they sought to relate to not only uh, heart disease and how it prevents it, but something to do with the kidney. So that's starting to filter into mainstream medicine. And then one last quick thing. Uh, just about a couple of weeks ago, we were given a name, and this young gentleman here, his name is uh, Fred Sue. He always gets embarrassed. But uh, Fred, Fred operates on how to heal the body naturally. And if you ask him if you have a break, listen to his story. It's an incredible story in how he healed his body 
of a stroke that took him down totally. And uh, if you look at Fred, you know, you, you ask him what his age is, he's always embarrassed. He said, but Fred is 64 years old. He has the energy of somebody 45 or 50. And he believes in doing things just totally naturally. He has it through Chinese medicine and herbs. He has learned, forced to learn, a different way how to heal the body. So you have an opportunity. Why don't you just stand up and just let everybody see Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm, my name is Fred Su. Uh, I got a stroke uh, 10 years before. Uh, in that time, uh, my left side, the whole body is dead. Uh, but my wife saved my life uh, because in that time, I want to kill myself because I cannot go to the restroom. I cannot